Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to this week's installation of Cyber Church. We are proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And that is exactly what Jesus said the church was supposed to do from the time that he left until the time that we usher his return back. We are supposed to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And so, you know, I've been, I've been teaching and preaching on the kingdom of God for decades. And in the last few years, I have really felt like God wanted me to really step up what we're doing so that uh, the church, so that believers will hear, know, understand what the kingdom of God is and understand what to do with the information. But I want you to understand something. When we talk about the kingdom of God, or when I talk about the kingdom of God, or when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he was not talking about a realm that has value or meaning simply because we doctrinally understand it, or simply because we say the right buzzwords. I tell you, I, you know, I've, I've been walking with the Lord for almost 50 years, and I've got news for you. I've heard everything that you could imagine in the name of preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and the reality was there was nearly nothing about the kingdom in many of those messages that I have heard over the past 50 years. So this series is designed to help you grasp what the kingdom is and help you then know how to enter into that realm that, has, that is called the kingdom and then enjoy all of the benefits of the resources of the kingdom. That's, that's the very reason that God wants you to understand what the kingdom is, believe the truth about what the kingdom is. Now, I want to say this, and we're going to talk about this a little bit today. When I first came to the Lord, I went to a great little church. The people were so good to me. They helped me so very much. I had a great pastor. I was so uh, fortunate. Now, they, they didn't believe what I believed. They didn't want to believe what I believed. And they really didn't want anybody around talking about the things that I was talking about. But it really wasn't because they were bad people. Here's something I have learned over the years. People who have an actual intimate personal relationship with God are very secure in their faith. They're very secure in their salvation. But if your intimate relationship is not with God, if it is with your doctrine, then the problem is if somebody challenges your doctrine, then you experience that as your very salvation being challenged or questioned. And it will put you on the defensive. It'll get you angry. You know, one of the greatest things that happened to me, and and I am not saying this to belittle anybody, but as I've told you before, half my family was Church of Christ, half my family uh, were were very fundamental legalist Baptists, and uh, man, they just fought all the time. But I had an aunt that I lived with, my aunt and uncle that I lived with, and they were good to me. They both loved me. My aunt loved me. My uncle loved me. And it was, it was the greatest uh, year and a half of my life when I lived, ran away from home and lived with them in high school. But as a child, I lived with my uncle and my grandmother uh, on and off for several years because there was no one to take care of me. So when I gave my life to the Lord, uh, man, I'm telling you, I was, I was rejoicing in salvation. I was rejoicing that the old Jim Richards had died and that I was a new man and that I had the life and the power of God working and flowing in me. And I, I'm telling you, I, 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 was, it was, I was ecstatic it was, and I was living heaven on earth. And so one day I get a phone call from my aunt And she was very, very, very staunch Church of Christ. And, uh, you know, she felt like she was serving people by kind of browbeating them about what denomination they went to, what church they went to, what doctrines they believed, and all, all that kind of stuff. And basically, she was a fighter for the Church of Christ doctrine. Well, you know, that never particularly 
bothered me all all that much. I mean, you know, she had she had her right to see the Bible the way she saw it, and she had her right to challenge me and other people on our beliefs. But one day my phone rang, and I I hadn't been saved, but probably less than a year or something like that. And so uh, probably just a few months actually. And and you know, when I was a kid, my family called me Jimmy. Uh, you know, I don't particularly like that. That's what they, I was called when I was a child. By the time I was a teenager, everybody started calling me Jim, and that's the way it's been in my whole adult life. But my phone rings, and, and it was my aunt, and she was nice, and she was gorgeous. She said, Jimmy, uh, I appreciate this change in your behavior, but you are still going to hell because uh, you are not a part of the right church. Now, if my security of salvation is with a particular church, if it is with a particular doctrine, if it is a, with a particular group, or, or if it's following a particular leader, then the real truth is my faith is not in Jesus. My faith is in my doctrine. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees one time, he said, you search the scriptures because you, and these are the scriptures that, that speak of me. And he said, you think you're going to find eternal life in them. And you're not. You find life in me. The life of God is found in faith in Jesus. The life of God is experienced to the degree that we know God. You know, Jesus said, John 10, 10, he said, I've come to might have life and have it more abundantly. And I think it's John 17 that says, and this is life to know uh, God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So, it doesn't matter how much doctrine you know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about anything. What matters is, am I trusting personally the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for my salvation? But the great thing that came out of this, I, you know, I didn't get mad at her. We didn't have a fight. I said, you know what? I'll come over and talk to you. So I went over one day and I took my Bible and she and I sat down at her dining room table and we talked for hours. And, uh, you know, uh, churches and groups that have, that, that think they're the only one, that think they're the only way, that think they're, the, you know, the only their people are going to go to heaven, you know, they generally, and, and many cults, I'm not, and I'm not saying that every group that thinks they're the only ones going to heaven is, is cult, but I'm saying cult groups and, and groups that think they have the only way, they tend to not really read the Bible to uh, and use it as a pathway to understand God's character and nature and, and, and to discover who he is intimately and personally, they tend to go through and they will be taught in church. They will memorize certain scriptures. And so they build a, an entire argument around these scriptures and they argue these scriptural points. And so that day I just kept bringing it back to, well, wait a minute. Uh, where are you in your personal relationship with Jesus? And that was a question she, she could never answer because that was outside of the scope of, uh, of, her, of her faith. It was outside of the, the way she read the scriptures. She didn't read the scriptures that way, that it was about a personal relationship and this sort of thing. And so, and so it was such a blessing to me to have that kind of challenge early on in my walk with God, because I had to make some decisions. Uh, and the primary decision that I had to make was, is my faith rooted in my doctrine or is my faith rooted in knowing Jesus? And secondly, is knowing Jesus producing the life of God in me and in, and in my circumstances? You know, we know the will of God. It always amazes me when people are like, I, I, I'm not sure what the will of God is. Well, I can tell you what, there are some things that are very clearly identified as the will of God in the scripture. And so people are always wanting the will of God to happen. And I'm like, well, well why isn't it happening in your life? Well, I don't know. I don't know why God wants it. Maybe there's sin in my life. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Well, I got news for you. That is not the case. And I want to talk to you today about establishing the will of God. Now, I'm going, to try, I'm going to run through some stuff here. And you know what? Here's the great thing about doing these, uh, 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 doing Cyber Church every single week, and that is that every week, 
whatever time we stop, I can go next, some more next week. I can go some more the next week. And I will go and go and go and go to get you everything that you need to know. So if, the first thing that I want you to understand is this. The, the very first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is a yud, which looks like, kind of like a, an apostrophe, a vav, which is kind of at a slant, and then another yud under that. Now, and that's called the aleph. And so the aleph represents vav, which is the letter for man, and then yud yud, which is, which is the letter for God's message and, and God's will and all those things. And so the very first letter of a Hebrew alphabet, the aleph, actually represents man as being the one who harmonizes heaven and earth. In other words, the one who brings uh, heaven and earth into functioning the way God intends. The one who brings earth into functioning the way God is functioning in heaven is man. And so it, is, it falls to man to harmonize and to establish the will of God on earth. As a matter of fact, man's role in planet earth, uh, you know, of course, we, you know, we want to be born again. We want to come to know the Lord. We want to have a meaningful relationship with God. But as far as our function here on planet earth, you remember, and this is one of the, you know, this is one of the, one of the pillars of the faith. One of the pillars of the faith is that God created man in his own likeness and his own image and gave man authority here on planet earth. So God does not have authority on planet earth other than how it is expressed and exercised through human beings. Now I'm telling you, religion hates that. Religion does not want you to know that. Religion does not want you to know that the truth about the authority of a human being. You know, as Christians, we talk a lot about the authority of the believer, but the real truth is God gave authority to the human race. How evil the world is, how godly the world is, all determines on how man, what man is establishing here on planet Earth. So man's role in planet Earth was and still is to establish God's will here on planet Earth. And so when you have God's will here on planet Earth, then you have God's kingdom here on planet Earth. I mean, stop and think about it. The tabernacle in the Old Testament, and remember, everything, everything in the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and going into Canaan and how they lived in Canaan, every bit of that is actually uh, a type, an example, a model of what it looks like whenever man is pursuing God's role as defined by the Word of God. So, in the wilderness, the children of Israel built the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was built by man under the direction of God Himself through His representative Moses. And the tabernacle, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, was actually built based on the heavenly tabernacle. In other words, it was a copy of what was in heaven so that man would have a model here on earth to understand uh, what goes on in heaven, to understand God's will in heaven, to understand what's happening in heaven. And so the truth of it is, the tabernacle is, is one of the early types of, uh, of man establishing the will of God here on earth. Now, in the New Covenant, it's not Moses that has given us direction about how to establish God's will and God's domain here on planet Earth. It is Jesus himself. Jesus himself came and in his entire ministry, he preached predominantly the gospel of the kingdom. His parables were about the kingdom. It was all about kingdom living, knowing God and the Lord Jesus as king, knowing uh, a life 
uh, and experience in life as the realm of the king, the protection of the king, and the provision of the king as heaven here on earth. We are supposed to live in heaven here on earth uh, and, uh, so that we can experience God now. You know, you know, I think I mentioned this in the, in the last message. You know, when I first got saved, uh, among denominational people, it was pie in the sky and the great by and by. In other words, there was no sense much of what we were supposed to be doing. I was fortunate the church that I was in believed in winning the loss. And, and so uh, the pastor was active in winning the loss. I was very active in winning the loss. I don't know that anybody else in the church was, but the two of us were. And so, so, you know, we were about, we were about God's business, but, uh, I didn't understand that our role here on planet earth was bigger than just winning the loss. That is, that is part of it. And until you understand the gospel of the kingdom, you don't really understand even how all that fits in or, or I didn't. Now the law is a model, for example, of how we are to treat one another in order to establish God's will in our individual lives. As we treat people the way God would have treated them. You know, these people that say that the law is bad, these people that say that the law uh, is based on fear, I'm sorry, they are, they are completely wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. And I'm saying they don't have much of a relationship with God through Jesus. You know, the Bible says that Jesus came and, and, it, and it says, you know, no man had ever seen the Father except Jesus. And it says that Jesus was with God and he was God. Up until Jesus came, that nobody that ever interpreted any part of the Old Testament got it right. They got close, but they never got it right. So, you know, I've said this before, eight out of 10 of the commandments uh, were about how to treat each other. Doesn't have to do with relating to God, had to do with relating to one another because God wanted us to be, he wanted his followers to be the model of how God treats people and how much God loves people. Well, you know, Israel totally failed at that. And you know that, uh, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' day totally failed at that. And you know that for most of the last nearly 2,000 years, the church has failed at that. Now, keep in mind, all of the six, what is it, 615, 613 commandments uh, uh, that, that God gave Israel when they went into the promised land all of these were, every one of them were proportionately based on the Ten Commandments, and it was showing how the Ten Commandments would apply in a civil situation so that there could be civil order, justice, and fairness, and all that thing to have a good economy, have good health, and all of those things in, in a national setting. And so, so that means 80% of these 600, what, 615, 613, I can't remember. Uh, laws were actually all based on the Ten Commandments. So 80% of, of whatever that number was, uh, was all about walking in love toward one another, treating each other fairly, uh, showing, you know, showing uh, one another the love of God the, and uh, treating each other, each other the way God would treat us. So then Jesus comes, and keep in mind, everybody up until Jesus no matter how close they got, they still had a tendency to put their own spin on their interpretation uh, of the Word of God. And so Jesus comes on the scene, and he was with God, he was God, and, and he was the Word of God made flesh. In other words, the problem with the Word of God was all of these people that were trying to teach us how we should interpret it and apply it. Number one, they never did it from love. Jesus did everything that he did from love, from God's desire to redeem man and give us an incredibly wonderful life. And so everything that Jesus did, if God the Father had been here on planet Earth and you wanted to know what he would do, he would do exactly what Jesus did. Now, the problem is, 
we have a Christless Christianity. I mean, the, 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 that thing that Jesus said where, where, you know, my name is on your lips, but not in your heart. That's where the church is today. We talk all about Jesus, but we have a gospel that is totally different than what Jesus lived, totally different than what Jesus preached, totally different than what Jesus accomplished and, and sealed by his death, burial, and resurrection, totally different from the covenant of peace that God has, that God has made with us. And, and the majority of believers that I know, their prayer life, their approach to God is they're begging God to establish his will on planet Earth. And, or they're deciding what the will is God, of God is, and they're begging God to establish what they want to happen. And neither one of those scenarios are biblically based. Neither one of those scenarios are rooted in the New Testament. In just a minute, you're going you're to start to understand this, I'm telling you, over the upcoming weeks. And also, if you get my book, Heaven on Earth, and you get the series, Heaven on Earth, which we're making you a great special offer on this, I am telling you, uh, your world is going to change. Everything about how you pray, everything about how you walk with God is going to change for the better. It's going to become more intimate. You're not going to be confused about the will of God anymore. You're not going to be confused about what God wants to have happen in your life. So be sure, you know, there's not a hundred percent overlap between my video messages that I put out, for, out here for free and my audio message. I am trying to use both of these vehicles to give you everything that you're going to need to know. And so, um, uh, we always make an audio series that is designed for people who, who are much more, who are very serious about being disciples, who are very serious uh, uh, about, uh, about applying this to their life. And we usually have exercises that people do and we, we, su we suggest some things. So be, be sure and, and check that out. All right, so Hebrews 11 has always been uh, one of those scripture uh, or one of those chapters that man has just spoken to everybody around the world for centuries. In Hebrews eleven eight it says this: it says by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. Now I want you to know Abraham was on a journey to Canaan. Now Canaan and God. God promised it to Abraham and his descendants, which is what we now know as the nation of Israel. One of the reasons the nation of Israel has the right to exist and to be there is because God is the owner of planet Earth. And if the owner of planet Earth says, this is your nation, this is where you will live and dwell, then that settles it. And so that means that the people that war and fight against and, and, and try to stir up trouble in Israel, these are people that hate God. These are people that do not want the will of God here done here on planet Earth. So Abraham, he sets out on this journey for Canaan. And you notice it says that really when he was called to go to this place uh, that uh, that that was going to be an inheritance, he didn't really know for sure where he was going. He was just trusting God, walking with God, and following God. But it, it goes on to talk about Jacob and, and, and all, the other, all the other patriarchs, and it says, they looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, just like the tabernacle was a model of the tabernacle in heaven, Canaan was to be a model of what heaven was like. And that's why Canaan was a land that flowed with milk and honey. It was a land that flowed with resources. It had, you know, it had grapes so big that it took, uh, it took two men to carry them uh, and show them to Moses and the rest of the children of Israel. And, and the Bible talks about the fact that the nation of Israel was called there to live in houses that they didn't build. They were called there to live in and uh, eat from vineyards that they did not plant. In other words, this is, this is a type of heaven where this is your inheritance is something you receive from God, not by the sweat of your brow. And so God has called us to pursue a city 
whose builders and maker or a dwelling whose builder and maker is God. Now, again, we have thought that the will of God was done when a believer prayed a prayer and asked God to do his will, or, or that when they come up with an idea of what the will of God and try to force God to do their will. The will of God, however, is something that is done when a believer uses his or her authority to bring heaven down to earth, or as you might say, to bring earth into alignment and into authority with that which has already happened in heaven. Now, we don't, God's, already, God, God's already told us what happened through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But I got to tell you, I, I, I've spoken to, I don't even, millions of believers around the world. And to be honest, I find very few that actually know what Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, I have an incredible series called Three Days That Changed the World. Because, you know, the, the important part of what Jesus did for us did not happen while he was hanging on the cross. That was part of it. That's where he delivered us from wrath. And then when he goes into, into Hades, that is where he pays the price that we should have paid. And then when he was raised from the dead, he received an inheritance that he shares with us. And when we believe into him, then we are baptized into his body. We live in him, we dwell in him, and we share all things with him. So when you look at the Greek word for kingdom, when it talks about the kingdom of God, it's talking about a royal power, a kingship, a dominion, a rule, a territory subject to the rule of a king. So really, it is our job to know what Jesus has established in heaven and then use our faith to establish it here in planet Earth. And I promise you through this series and through the book that you're going to be reading, I am telling you, we are, we are, going, to, we are going to dive into this in ways that you just can't imagine. It's going to become so clear and so simple that the concept of operating in faith is just going to be phenomenal for you. Listen, be sure if you're watching this on YouTube to like it. Be sure if you know people that help to share it with other people. And be sure to join me again next week. I'm going to tell you something. This is going to be one of the most powerful, influential series that you have ever heard. It's going to change your life in ways that you absolutely can't imagine. And I'm going to tell you by next week, you are going to, you're going to open your eyes the, or the eyes of your heart to the kingdom of God. And you are going to discover how to step right into that kingdom and that power. I can't wait till next week.